attempted to uh, uh, extract some money from me. The interesting thing about it was is that he knew me. <laughs> and, and, and for those of you who uh, know my background as a prosecuting attorney, uh, for several years, this guy truly knew my name, my first name. And uh, he obviously needed some money. And at 1030 at night, I didn't think that uh, the McDonald's store was still open. But in any event, I mean, we have these kinds of intersections with the homeless, and we typically define them by mail, uh, someone that hadn't had a bath in about three or four weeks, and is somewhere between the ages of 45 and 60. And, and that is a very narrow, narrow definition. And I hope that one of the things that we do as an issue of community awareness is really expand the definition of who the homeless truly are. Because we're not just dealing with that type of stereotypical definition. We're dealing with children. We're dealing with uh, women. We're dealing with people that, but for the grace of God, it could be you or I, who find ourselves in a situation with a lost job, with tremendous responsibilities, with typical debts that we all seem to acquire along the way, and all of a sudden we find ourselves in very desperate straits, in very desperate situations. And so one of the things when we talk about why we're here tonight, for tomorrow, about creating a day resource center, is really to look at it and to look at the continuum of, of challenges and the continuum of needs that we have. We'll hit the whole panorama of issues that we as good people and good citizens need to give to our fellow man and woman. And so when we talk about a day resource center and we talk about what is needed, the components that are needed there, we've got to think broader than just that stereotype. We have got to think about the medical needs. We've got to think about the, the substance and drug abuse needs. We need to think about the educational and job retraining needs. The issue of not only temporary shelter, but permanent homes and shelter. We need to think about good jobs and jobs that are going to give the stability back to a family or to a, to a, 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 a group of people that are going to be able to put them back on their feet again. Uh, and so it's a very, very complex issue. One of the things, and I had a chance to talk to one of our speakers, uh, Murray Lay, who, who I asked about, I said, you know, one of the things that we really need to talk about is, and we have many, many people who want to help, and it always gets down to, from a city standpoint, an issue of location. And I think we've got to address that issue head on. Our community needs to embrace the fact that we can do this in a sensible, commonplace way and recognize the importance of location at the same time not let everybody say, well, you know, it's really great that you're doing this, but hey, I don't want it in my backyard, and I don't want it in that backyard, or that front yard. And so one of the challenges, and I think it's really where we look to you architects that are in the audience, one of the challenges is how we can integrate the Day Resource Center into neighborhoods or into wherever the community would wind up figuring out where to locate this. And, and that is a tremendous challenge for us, a tremendous challenge for us as people in terms of understanding terms of location. You know, uh, we have, uh, I'm talk about housing, we have 25 uh, emergency shelters for transitional housing uh, providers, for permanent housing providers right now, 25 right here uh, that are providing housing. And I don't think we recognize the number of providers that we have out here that are trying to make a difference in people's lives. Uh, that doesn't count the ones that don't. Those are just the ones that, that acquire money from the federal government through, through HUD, through Housing and Development. We have several large shelters, two of which are here at Little Rock, that take no federal monies that house at least 300 uh, people a night. And, and so when you talk about that and you talk about these shelters, you've got to look at how many people we have as individuals who are, who are really homeless. And it's been estimated in Arkansas over the course of last year that we've had about 22,000 people. In Arkansas, we've been determined to be homeless throughout the state, many of them located here in our, in our urban capital area. And secondly, uh, when you look at that, it could be as much as 8,000 a night. Uh, not all of them here, but many of them in central Arkansas. So it is, a, it is a real challenge for us. It is something that from a focus and an issue of, of, of public responsibility, we need to embrace and we need to tackle this challenge and figure out how to accomplish it. And I know that with the hard work of presenters tonight and their efforts tomorrow, we are going to be able to move forward on, on, our, on our program and on our, on our ability to implement our plan that we have to try and conquer the homeless issue. And with that said, it is my pleasure to make a proclamation to the American Institute of Arkansas, or the American Institute of Architects, the Arkansas Division, 
uh, certainly using this issue as a, as a benchmark, a, a real keystone for the 150th anniversary. It's my pleasure to read this proclamation and to present this to the president of the Arkansas chapter of the American Institute of Architects, uh, Gail Hunter Bannon. This proclamation reads as follows, Know ye all the people by these presents and greetings, whereas April 13th, 2007 marks the 150th anniversary of the American Institute of Architects, and whereas the American Institute of Architects continues to engage the architectural profession in service to its communities by and through working collaboratively with government officials and business leaders, and engaging local community leaders and their citizenry in a dialogue about basic community design principles, and identifying neighborhood conditions needing improvement, and by demonstrating the visionary role of the architectural profession in the creation of a better, more sustainably livable quality of life for us all. Now, therefore, I, as Mark Stola, mayor of the city of Little Rock, hereby proclaim April 13, 2007, as American Institute of Architects Day, with grateful appreciation, the city of Little Rock honors more than 600 member professionals. 150 allied members of the Arkansas chapter of the American Institute of Architects for their generous contributions to our increasingly sustainable and ever more livable community. Gail, thank you very much. For We've uh, got uh, very special guests here tonight risk of not introducing everybody. I do want to uh, recognize the County Judge Buddy Lyons, as the County Judge Buddy Lyons, and North Little Rock Mayor Pat Hayes, who tomorrow will take us all to the ballpark and what a wonderful new addition uh, in our city and our state. <laughs> if you've not been over there to see that ballpark, you should go. It's absolutely fabulous. Uh, we have Mayor Doug Foreman of Jonesboro who is here. Mayor, welcome. You know, uh, Mayor Stoddard was talking about location. And when we started this project in 1997 to build this library and to refurbish this building to turn into a school, one of the great features about locating here was that in the traditional sense, we did not displace any homes. We displaced old warehouses and we displaced uh, abandoned buildings, but we did not displace any homes in the traditional sense. But in the non-traditional sense, and in what we're talking about tonight, Mayor, we displaced a lot of people. Um, when I uh, walked along the riverbanks, and when I saw the homes, not in the traditional sense, when I saw the numbers of people that were making their lives in these warehouses. Um, we realized that, you know, even in the best of intentions, we disrupt people's lives and people's well-being. So every day when I walk along that riverbank, and I walk down there a lot, that it does not always enters my mind that there were people living there. And tonight when you leave, I want to give you a valuable, visible, simple. Tonight when you leave, drive away from this property and look at the Rock Island Bridge. Look at the compartment at the top of that bridge, which has the mechanical equipment when that bridge was operating. When we started this project and I walked down here for the first time, on this 30 acres of old, worn out, unsafe, drug-ridden property, there was a human being living in that apartment. And in essence, we took his home. So for all the progress that we've made and for all the good that this has done, I must tell you that when someone says to me, do you have any regrets about this project? Yes, I do. There is one. And that is the fact that we displaced people. And it was like, they'll be homeless somewhere else. And I think that is a community challenge and I applaud the mayors um, for working together on it. It's my pleasure now to introduce to you my friend who is in charge of the 150th celebration uh, and giving something back to the community, member of the AIA, a longtime friend, 
great architect, and more importantly, the father of Beth Weedauer, <laughs> who is doing fabulous work in Helena, Arkansas, and when she unveils this website on Friday about products in the Arkansas Delta, you can see a young woman who is making a huge difference in the quality of life of a lot of people. So please welcome Beth's father, Bill Weedauer. <laughs> It's really the best introduction I've ever had. Uh, I want to thank you, Skip, and the Clinton School for hosting this event. Uh, it makes it much more meaningful than if we had done this anywhere else. Uh, I have the pleasure tonight to introduce our two speakers. Uh, we were able to get two people that address what we're looking at very specifically. Uh, the first, our first speaker is Murray Legg. He's an architect from Austin, Texas. Uh, Murray has designed and, and the project has built the uh, Austin Resource Center for Homes. Just so happens the acronym is ARCH. I remember that. Uh, Murray is uh, was elected or, or we'll have to get the class. Again, Murray works with L LZP Architects in Austin. Uh, he was uh, in 19, I'm sorry, 2006, was a recipient of the Young Architect uh, Professional Award for Austin. Austin's a great city to be an architect in. Uh, he is also won the prestigious Lacinia Fellowship and uh, is a uh, very big advocate for what we're doing. Uh, Murray's going to show you slides from the project in Austin. Again, it's built. We know it can be done. Uh, our other speaker is Michael Stoops from uh, the National Coalition for Homeless in Washington, D.C. Michael has been to Little Rock a number of times, and uh, we're, we're getting kind of both ends of the spectrum here, and I am extremely pleased. Uh, Michael has been working with the homeless most of his adult life. He uh, is the director for the National Homeless Civil Rights Organization organizing project. Uh, he also serves as the project director for the National Coalition for Homeless Faces of Homelessness Speakers Bureau. Uh, when I called to ask about getting a speaker, I didn't know I'd get the head guy, but I'm extremely pleased. And uh, without any further ado, Murray's going to start us out and then Michael will follow that. Thank you. Well, thank you, Bill and AI Arkansas, for uh, the invitation to speak today. It's really moving to see the number of people that have come out to address this subject. It's really incredible to see the interest in this. And it's really actually moving as an architect to come and to be a part of this and share our experiences in Austin. I want to first say that. Uh, a project like this is really an incredible journey. It began for us about 10 years ago as we participated as architects in a large group of people beginning to brainstorm and program how a project like this could occur. And I have to say that my perspective is a perspective of architects. It's one part of a much larger team that was involved in this project happening. And I think also this is a perspective uh, from an architect that is involved in this team in a very specific that is Austin, Texas, and every community has got to find its own way through this problem, its own solutions, because it's much more than just finding this is the right design, we're going to build this, we're going to put it here. In other words, there's no single solution. That being said, I'd like to do two things tonight. First, I'd like to present uh, some broader concepts or ideas, uh, concepts and ideas that I think carry through from community to community. And these are ideas that at once, uh, we kind of used and applied in, in our building design, we didn't think about the building, but also ideas that emerged since the building was open. The building opened three years ago. I spent a tremendous amount of time down there, and this is an unusual project for us. Many people are interested in, in terms of its architecture, its sustainable design, so we can get on tours, but also for the combination of the architecture and the way in which it's serving the homeless population. So I've had the great fortune to spend a lot of time down there witnessing 
what works in the building, also what doesn't work in the building. And I'd really like to have a candid kind of conversation with you and talk about the things that I think are really successful and the things that I think could be improved upon. And hopefully these ideas you'll be able to use in thinking and moving your project forward. Over the last five or six years, we've had the great fortune of working on a handful of projects that, that address the needs of the homeless, the Austin Resource Center, the homeless being one. Um, we don't specialize in, in needs of the homeless, but again, it's been a privilege to work on these projects. Uh, my own interest in homelessness began really as an architecture student in New York City. Mm -hmm. I went to the Cooper Union School of Architecture, which is located at the head of the Bowery, where 7th Street intersects the Bowery. The Bowery, of course, uh, was a street that was uh, with the phrase Skid Row was coined. At that time, there were not as many homeless on the Bowery. The homeless were actually living mostly in the East Village. I lived in the Lower East Side in each apartment, and I would ride my bike up Avenue B to 7th Street, across 7th Street, to the school, crossing past Tompkins Square Park. And Tompkins Square Park at the time, uh, this was the late 80s, had, would slowly over the course of the year be taken over by the homeless. Would start out kind of empty, one person would camp out, another person would camp out, and slowly over the course of the year, this incredible shanty town would emerge. And as an architecture student, you know, I was really kind of fixated more on formal concerns, technical concerns, and I just was simply captivated by this slowly changing, developing city within a city, more from the kind of ingenuity and innovation that people would show. Many of the structures were mobile, there were structures that were built with uh, shopping carts, with cardboard plastic with uh, duct tape with string and rope. It was slowly kind of built up over time. I took an interest in this uh, from urban design class. I actually entered the park and talked to the homeless and kind of studied it and presented it as a kind of new urban form. It was an interesting thing. The interesting, a more interesting point I think was the tension that would build up obviously in the park as the park was taken over by the homeless and the city proper. Every year the police would come in and this happened year after year until I think it was late, it was 88 or 89. Uh, I was actually away that summer, and it was a particularly vibrant shanty town that had been built in the park. And I came back that summer, and the park was completely white clean, and fences were placed up around the entire park. And that was the summer of the famous Tompkins Square riots, where when the police came up to clear the shanty towns, several thousand New Yorkers came out to protest that. And I think the point was, for me, at that point, I realized that this was much more than just a kind of technical issue, much more than just an issue of, you know, what kind of clever systems or ingenious design can we develop. It was really a very, very powerful social issue, an issue that needed to be addressed on the front many different, um, in many different levels. The image on the screen is uh, an image by, uh, a sculpture by artist, uh, Dashi Kawamata, and I think that the ideas that are kind of provoked by a piece like this is that it's, you know, on one hand, the shanty town structures are kind of ubiquitous form you find in many, many cities where the homeless exist, and they are in stark contrast to what is another kind of ubiquitous form of housing. In America, which is a single family residence, I just have a piece to a newspaper, the two houses in my neighborhood, and believe it or not, $500,000 is the sort of average, you know, single family residence. And I think that one of the really important, broader issues that this raises is the notion of transition. And when we're talking about providing a homeless day resource center, uh, single room occupancy apartments, we're often talking about an architecture of transitional housing. In fact, embedded in the Austin Resource Center for the Homeless's mission is that the building will have the building services will help the homeless transition out of homelessness. And I think that one of the really important notions is that transition to what? I mean, if there aren't viable permanent housing solutions for the people on the street, then they end up in a kind of cycle of they're within the transitional system. In other words, you build a resource center for the transition through the resource center back on the street and around. So, and I mention this to say that I think on one hand it's an incredibly interesting design challenge. What I mean, would a you know thirty thousand dollar dwelling look like? You know, with a 
mortgage over 30 years. Uh, this is a, a design problem. Uh, personally, I don't feel like there are enough options for permanent housing for the homeless. And I say this in that when you begin to conceive a, a homeless resource center, a data resource center, it's important to think about how that transitional building, transitional services work within a larger system. In other words, I think that they're very critical programs and that these programs, again, if they're transitioning people, they have to be transitioning to some kind of viable housing option, which has to be considered within, to be, I think, really to solve this problem. While we were designing the Austin Resource Center for Homes, I conducted a workshop at the University of Texas and I asked the students to select sites within the university itself, uh, sites that the homeless might crash out at. There are places that were very public, uh, but also kind of undercover. I asked the students to um, go to Home Depot and purchase about $10 worth of material, bridge uh, insulation, fencing, pipe. And it was really meant as a design exercise. I'd asked them to create behind it a model of dwelling structure. And they came up with some kind of very interesting inventive solutions. This is a kind of tent, but also a kind of chair, kind of an invertible box. This piece is nested against a vending machine and folds out so you have to get cell things in through the openings in the wall. I think on one level, these, this exercise, you know, was interesting for them. They, it was exhilarating to kind of build outdoors to uh, ease of use of the materials, but put things very quickly and seeing things together very quickly. Uh, it was important. They came up with some beautiful and, and interesting solutions. Not solutions that I would consider viable options for homeless dwelling, but I think that the exercise touched on a very important idea was that when they were outdoors kind of building these structures, they were constantly brushing up against the public that were using the spaces. In this case, this is a tunnel that the students in the university would kind of pass through. Although we had permission from the university at large, the walking guards would come out and tear the structures down, and that's just what we were doing. So the students were designing in this space, in the space of this incredible social pressure, that this was a kind of form of vandalism or graffiti. And I think that. This exercise touches on one of the another very important component to addressing the problem, and that is that you know when you propose a day resource center uh, for a city like Little Rock, you're going to have a lot of passionate kind of response to that, both positive and negative. When you select the site, and I think it was really important, as the mayor pointed out, that this energy that comes both positive and negative has to be addressed in a very, very positive way and has to be addressed head on. There's no way to kind of do this thing away from the community, in the studio as it were, and, and then bring the solution in and kind of magically it's there and solved. It has to be something that occurs actually out on the street with the community, with the homeless, and all of the service providers. Initially, it was conceived as a kind of 
urban campground. It's a green space, a green space that was uh, actually this parking lot. Uh, this parking lot here would be kind of a large slab that would be placed for the parking lot, plant trees, turn into a kind of park. And then the homeless did camp there. And this shelter was conceived of as what we call a low demand shelter. And this raises another important concept, which is the difference between the high demand shelter versus the low demand shelter. The low demand shelter is basically a place that, um, a, a center that will place the least number of requirements on the users, on the homeless, to use the facility. In other words, if you're drunk, you can use it. If you're, um, you have a pet, you can, you can use the facility. You don't have to pay a fee. Um, high demand shelters typically place a lot of requirements on the users. It may be enrolling in certain substance abuse programs, it may be uh, attending a religious service, it may be, um, again, paying fees. So there is a range of different ways in which a shelter can be conceived, low demand versus high demand. We started out with this idea of extremely low demand. This was simply a place for the homeless, a safe place. There was some control for the homeless to camp, to spend time away from the parks. What developed, in fact, was something really quite different. It was a much more institutional building. And our clinic, uh, which is 27,000, sorry, our resource center is 27,000 square feet, is composed of a variety of different uses. There's a common use day room, shower facilities, locker, laundry, computer room, offices, uh, spaces for different uh, co located programs, we call them. There's a clinic and an overnight shelter, which is 100 beds. This is basically the kind of backbone of the, of, of the, the program itself. And again, it was a kind of long journey to get to the specific program. It took a long time. I think that one of the more interesting aspects of the program, interesting and, and really important aspects of the program, is actually not on the list at all. And that's that the homeless spend a tremendous amount of time and hanging around, waiting for services, meeting with their friends. And the building has actually acted as a kind of uh, focal point for that congregation. Initially, we anticipated this to a certain degree, and this is the first floor plan. So the building's sited on the corner, and it's a very comp compact site. It's about 150 feet by 150 feet. As you can see, it's a square. It's a square that's carved out. So there's an outdoor space on the corner. There's a parking court that's a kind of multi-purpose space carved out of the block. The clinic is shaded here as a clinic. We don't have time to go, go into kind of detail here um, as to the kind of arrangement spaces, laundry facility lockers. But this large space along 7th Street was conceived of as really the kind of main entry space. Early on, we decided that we were going to have a creative shelter that was really kind of open and accessible to the homeless, very visible. So we placed this, this space along 7th Street, and it connects with the outdoors. And it's really not, it's an unprogrammed space. It's called the day room, but it has the main entry desk, points of entry, the front doors are located off of the upper courtyard, the back doors off the parking area, so people are kind of entering into one central location. And this openness and transparency, I think, cuts across several different ideas. One is that we want to create a shelter, again, that's really open and accessible to the homeless, that's connected to the street, connected to the place where the homeless were dwelling. It also was in line with the downtown Boston design guidelines were promoting kind of more traditional development in the city, in other words, storefront-like development with building out to the street edge, visibility of uses, parking in the back, so it's kind of in line with that, with those, with those design guidelines. The parking area in the back, too, I think was conceived of as potentially flexible space. Although one can park cars there, there's also the potential to use it as a kind of courtyard for queuing and that sort of thing. 
again, we didn't have a shelter like this. We didn't know who was going to be running the shelter, so we're kind of guessing over the development and design for this. An interesting thing occurred, though, that I think is, is really central to the problem, that when the building was Across the frames. 
And the second floor was arranged against a very, very dense building. It was like a you know, Rubik's cube kind of fit all the bits and pieces in. We were on a very tight budget. We had to keep the spaces to a minimum. On the second floor, the shower facilities, which are located with kind of ease of use and access through a staircase down to the entry lobby area. Again, we wanted people when they came in the building, when the homeless were coming in the building, to have easy access to the services that they used, like the laundry facility. We wanted them to be able to come in and see people doing the laundry. I mean, a sense of kind of normalcy, rather than bearing the laundry facility in the back. We kind of presented that as that this is something that people do on a day to day basis. The shower facility is again located on the second floor, kind of ease of access to the staircase. And then there's a large dining room uh, and, and a commercial kitchen. In the middle is a really all the staff areas and all of the office areas. I wanted to just point to one of the, I think, more successful aspects of the program. And that's that it's an open, flexible office space for co-located, what we call the co-located programs. And these are programs that allow for a flexible office space for all of the different service providers that existed in Austin that didn't have the resources or the funding to have their own offices, have access to a copy machine, have access to a fax machine, have a study carol, or have uh, uh, a filing cabinet. For instance, a group of retired veterans that provide clothing for the homeless as something they do, worked out of their uh, garage in their, in, in their house, have a study carol here, they can go, they can use a fax machine, they can use all of the resources of an office that they normally wouldn't be able to afford. So many of these co-located programs, there's a, a newspaper that's run by the homeless that has an office here, are situated within this open kind of flexible office space. When we're talking about sustainable design, something we try to do too is to introduce um, many components of energy efficiency Lighting within a building is responsible for a tremendous amount of energy consumption. Something like 40% of the building's energy uses goes into lighting the building. So we place a great emphasis in the design on the use of natural light within the building. And again, this cuts across this idea of how to create a kind of open and accessible building, a secure building where lines of sight are kind of open and visible. This is a light bulb that cuts through the middle of the building. And it is completely unoccupiable. It's just a void space in the center of the building. And initially, you know, it was a very practical concern. We had this big block of the building. We didn't want people to feel kind of buried within. So we wanted to open it up. And this void space is perpendicular to this heavily used program space. And these two together, I think, are the kind of center or focal point, the formal kind of center of the building. In, in Texas, I think in, in Arkansas, you know, you always want to avoid great degree of exposure on your eastern and western sides with daylight. You have obviously the sun on the rise and sets the air coming into the building. So you want to shade that or avoid that kind of exposure there. So what we did in mean, the building's orientation in fact, uh, north is up in this picture, was to take that concept and turn it inside out. So we have this exposure east and west, but a very, very narrow slot. So that it allows for kind of diffuse light to kind of bounce around, shade of light to bounce around the building. See in the section here how that's over there. And the effect is, is really, I think, quite successful. And I think one of the more, more important um, things that this, this light well achieves is that it, in fact, acts to bind all of these disparate programs together. The void space, the empty space, the unoccup unoccupiable space it helps to connect everything together. And it does it in a very simple way. When you're in this, you're in the office area. You look down. You can look up to the shelter. You can look down to the park area. You can look across the office area. And in many places in the building, you have the sense of being able to see the different program elements and the different relation to one another. And again, there's a sense of security. You know what's going on. You know where people are. But also, you simply have a sense that you know where you are physically. You can kind of place yourself with respect to the other aspects of the program. Try to use some uh, innovative use of colored glass in the building over the entrance, and this colored light kind of radiates through the building and acts as a kind of focal point, kind of reference to the entry of the building. On the third floor, then, is a sleeping pavilion, 
And it's 100 beds. There's an outdoor terrace space. And again, it's aligned with the frames. And this idea really carried from the initial uh, concept of uh, providing a kind of uh, urban campground. This idea of being, you know, kind of up on the rooftops. So, so really this is conceived of as a two-story resource center and the sleeping pavilion is kind of located on the top of an outdoor space. You have the east and west. It's really a traditional organization. I mean, you have a two-story house, you have all of your kitchen and living facilities down below, or up to above, or in a traditional mixed-use uh, facility, you have all of your kind of commercial functions on the ground floor, the residential functions up above, so it kind of follows in that pattern. I think the interesting thing programmatically was that when, when we initially started to talk in public about the program, the program was 27,000 square feet and had a 100 bed shelter. The shelter component, interestingly enough, was the thing that everybody focused on. In fact, when I would talk to people about the project in public, they were like, we're going to spend $5 million to create a 100 bed shelter. Right? They had no idea that the shelter component itself was only 5,000 square feet out of the 27,000 square foot program. Because somehow they couldn't get their mind around all of the other programs that were going on in the building. The people in the media and the news always focused on the number of beds. And we kind of take the construction cost, $5 million, and buy the number of beds, $50,000 a bed. And this became a sort of, you know, phrase that people talk about. They believe it's $50,000 per bed. When really, as you can see, the shelter component is a really small component. So a lot of this has to do with the way in which the project is presented to the public, the way the housing component which is really the, the piece of the program that you know elicits the most kind of passionate response is presented. And I, I really want to wrap up here. I mean, I hope I've touched on some some uh, the ideas that are helpful. The last thing I'd like to say is that for us, I mean, I think there's a tremendous opportunity here, and you know, to approach this problem from a very positive perspective. And for Austin, I think one of the more successful things is that everybody knows this building. It's easily identifiable. It's seen in terms of its architecture as being something very, very positive. Now, it's not a perfect building in terms of the way it functions, but I think that it's really built on, built towards Austin's identity in a very positive way, which I think goes beyond the, the kind of concept of let's just do the minimum to provide for the homeless. In my opinion, good architecture, however that would be defined, shouldn't be just reserved for the important civic monuments like your libraries, your city halls, but there's an opportunity here for the city to really, you know, create something, to, you know, build on a very positive identity for the city in general. So, with that, thank you. Good afternoon. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm honored to be in the building of a school named after Bill Clinton. He's the only person I ever voted for who ever won the presidency. <laughs> uh, 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 I'm in Washington, D.C., where there's no homelessness, no crime. No homelessness. <laughs> uh, having worked with homeless people since 1972, uh, sometimes I meet people born in, in their, since the early 80s who believe that Homelessness began in 1981, but many of us old timers know that before the 1980s there were homeless people and there were the agencies that served them the Salvation Armies, the Rescue Missions, the Catholic Worker Houses of Hospitality. They served the homeless just like they do today because the mainstream programs, the government agencies, did not give a damn about our homeless population. The federal housing budget in 1979 under Jimmy Carter was $83 billion. Today, the federal housing budget under another president is $33 billion. So do the math. And why we have homelessness in America is that we cut the federal housing budget through the 1980s. We first saw uh, the numbers increase, more men and women and families, and the real impact came around 19. 84. And similar to today's uh, response, churches and synagogues opened their doors to shelters and soup kitchens in the mid-1980s. And many of the organizations that are, are around today were founded in the mid-1980s. 
In the 1980s, we were somewhat naive. We thought that homelessness was a temporary problem, and that if we just did something quickly, that we could end homelessness. We believe that if you give people three hots in a cot during that time period, or the four essences of life, soup, soap, sleep, salvation, that those things alone would end homelessness. And, and of course, it did not. Shelters in the 1980s, and, and, and there's still shelters today that is sleeping on a mat on a floor in a church basement. In the 1980s, our movement focused on the right to shelter. In the 1990s, we shifted, shifted to a right to housing because housing is really what homeless people need. They need homes. And today, our movement is focused on the right to housing with supportive services. The so-called uh, resource centers, multi-service centers, we used to call them a one-stop shopping center for homeless people with as many services under one roof, were first started in Orlando, in, the, in South Bend, Indiana, in the early 1990s. In, in the mid-1990s, because of a court case, Pottinger versus the city of Miami, in which we won, that said that the city of Miami could not arrest homeless people if there were no shelter beds available. And that forced Dade County and Broward County to build six large multi-service centers. Uh, there are many positive benefits of having a multi-service center. Uh, they have a proven track record around the country of helping people break out of that vicious cycle of homelessness. The services are more coordinated, more efficient, and more effective. There was a study done in the early 1990s in San Francisco that found that a typical homeless person spent 35 hours a week going from point A to point B to point C seeking services that should be under one roof, just like we do in our own homes. The multi-service centers have reduced the number of, of the visible homeless population in those cities, and, and because people need showers, they need laundry, and it will decrease the number of people living along the riverbank. And wherever they're located, it has always improved the quality of life in those neighborhoods or in those industrial areas. Some specific words of advice as you move during down the road of building a multi-service center is that you don't want to make it too large. When Miami first proposed a multi-service center, they wanted to build a 500-bed facility. We said, no, that's way too large. And we wrote letters and protested, and we whittled it down to about 300 beds. Uh, it should not look like a shelter or an institution, just like a resource center does not look like uh, an institution. It should serve everybody, the chronic and the non-chronic. There should be no fees, there should be no required case management or attending religious service. There should be no breathalyzer. I am always amazed that there are shelters that have breathalyzers. Once, one, one time I flew into Little Rock, we won't name the shelter, and I stayed at all the shelters in Little Rock, but I, I had a beer on a plane flying into Little Rock. And when I went to the shelter, they did a breathalyzer test on Michael Stoops, and I failed that breathalyzer test. I went to stay at the travel lodge in North, North Little Rock, the cheapest hotel that I could find. Uh, there needs to be rules, but they should be as few as possible. Uh, privacy issues are always a concern. Imagine if you're 60 years of age being required to go to church or having to wear pajamas or open dormitories. No door, no doors on toilet stalls. Oh, gym like showers. And homeless people like privacy, just like we all. There needs to be a place for pets. The homeless assistance center in Miami built a, a, a doghouse right next to the shelter in Miami, and I think that would be very easy to do. They need to be open year round, seven days a week. So forget about this thing of a day resource center. It should be 24 hours a day, seven days a week, year round, and that includes holidays. I don't, I don't want social workers closing their agencies during holidays, which they do. Um, they, they need to serve everybody, but throwing everybody in together, there needs to be special wings or floors for veterans, for young adults, for senior citizens. 
We need to involve the homeless population in setting the rules and the policy for running the shelters. And likewise, there, we need to involve the businesses and the neighbors in, in the shelter. There needs to be like a business neighborhood advisory council. We need to train staff and volunteers to be experts. I can tell you in this homelessness field, it's so complicated. You need to have one person on, on, on duty who knows everything about getting a birth certificate, how to get a, 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 a driver's license, how to apply for veterans' benefits. And we need to have homeless people involved, hire them as paraprofessional para staff. And some final uh, general words of advice, a lot of times when these centers are being built, and there's at least 10 that I know of, they market it as this is going to solve your homelessness problem in Little Rock. And there is no city in this country that shelters all of its homeless population. 44% of our nation's homeless are unsheltered. And that's why we're having the increasing attacks on homeless people done by teenagers. We need to make sure that we, we recognize the existing agencies who have been here before the war on poverty, before this new fancy multi-service center. We need to make sure that they get some of the new money. So all the new money should not just go to the new multi-service center, but we need to recognize the Our House, the Salvation Army, the Union Rescue Mission, uh, Arkansas Supportive Housing. Location, 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 just like the real estate is important. It needs to be in an area that's centrally located. Who runs it is also very important. I fought, I fought with two mayors, not, not the current mayor, who's a good guy. Uh, but last year, last summer, I fought with Mayor Frank Milton, the, the mayor, Democratic mayor of Jackson, Mississippi, who decided to open up a shelter and to have a curfew on homeless people, if you can imagine. As if homeless people have a home to go home to. Mayor Melton, I shamed him. You had to be on the streets for three weeks at, after 10 o'clock at night. And so we, we won on that battle. Then earlier this year, which we lost, the mayor of Columbia, South Carolina, a Democrat, another Democrat, was not happy with how a nonprofit was running a shelter. And so the city took over the shelter and ran the shelter. And lo you know what they did? They decided that we are going to run warrants on every homeless person who comes to the, to the shelter. And I suggested that we should run warrants on the mayor and everybody, all the donors, the volunteers, and they're still doing that today. So don't, so don't let any city uh, run it. Uh, there needs to be a housing component in it because the shelter is not a home, it's not the solution. Uh, we need homes for people. And finally, I know that Little Rock has a 10-year ten ten -year plan to end homelessness. The plans are great, but we need greater financial commitments from all level. But perhaps we should amend that plan and to say, let's put in this new multi-service center. And let's say that 10 years from now, we are going to make a point of closing this new multi-service center because we, we were able to end homelessness in Little, Little Rock, Arkansas. Thank you very much.
has won uh, a number of times. Austin's a great city, had a trip, uh, very progressive. They've got uh, they own the one of five largest public utilities in, uh, in the country. And, uh, and I know Will is doing a lot of things with wind power and, and so many uh, opportunities to, to really have Austin leadership uh, and leadership role, both nationally and certainly internationally, too. So it's a terrific city, and we compliment you for, for being here and, and also for what you do in, in Austin. Uh, Michael, uh, one of the things I was glad to hear you say that you came over to North Little Rock and stayed. Our, uh, our hotel and motel tax supports our parts. And we appreciate that very much. Uh, cheap, I wouldn't know. Economically and worthwhile, I'd probably use that phrase. Uh, and uh, Gaylin, if, uh, if you could come up here, let me just share with you uh, uh, our appreciation. Mark and I have been friends for a long time, and, and his comments were truly uh, uh, accurate and we underline those. This is the first time that uh, the cities of North Little Rock and Washington and Little Rock, not the first time we've combined, we've combined many things, but we both put uh, resources behind uh, uh, staff and, uh, and working toward ending homeless in 10 years. It's truly a metropolitan issue. The American Institute of Architects and, and certainly the Arkansas chapter, uh, I just want to underline my vote. I won't say surprise. But when I was asked to come here, and where this is your 150th anniversary, uh, and, and it was kind of nice that y'all came here right on bookends of when we open our ballpark tomorrow. So that was a, a, a nice stroke. But, but the real stroke was your profession undertaking a real social challenge. Uh, and, and, and as you look to this year and partnerships that you developed, we want to underline our commitment to be a part of that partnership appreciation for what you and your profession are doing uh, in creating places, uh, and that's what we all are about, and more and more we as mayors uh, realize that. Uh, Joe Riley, the mayor of uh, Charleston, South Carolina, began the Mayor's Institute of Urban Design, and more and more we are understanding that the, that the co cooperation and the collaboration between your profession and our profession uh, is one that's absolutely essential for the betterment of our citizens. So with that, let me give you tomorrow. Uh, I mean, I'll take it back tomorrow night from our ballpark's opening, but I'll give you tomorrow. And let me just share that I, Patrick Case, Mayor of North Little Rock, will claim this 12th day of April, uh, 2007, because of your activities tomorrow is Arkansas Architecture Day. Uh, and the, uh, in honor of the Arkansas Architects, the American Institute of Architect, Architecture, and certainly our kind of in our appreciation for what we, what you have done and what we are going to do. And for those of you who haven't heard, I've got two granddaughters, one's four and one's two, and I have pictures, and I couldn't tell if I would blend them into my comments, but I sure would be happy to tell you about it. And that's another thing that we're all looking forward to, is this fun and places you created and fun for him. So I've got pictures, and I'll show them to you after this show.
heating program, air conditioning during the summer, heated during, during the winter. So you can feed the squirrels and pigeons in, in, in our cities, but God forbid you try to feed homes. That makes no sense. Question. Hi, Michael. I just want to say that you still have as much passion as you've always had about the homeless, and we really appreciate that. I wanted to ask. The idea was the homes would be kind of bust out of the facility, and 
the cost of action. There's also a sort of rhetoric that you know, kind of you call it natural setting and so the city will be somehow healing or helping the homeless. But I think just you know, simply on a practical level, you know, you need to be in a location where the homeless are and provide services for them. It needs to be uh, a location that has easy access to public transportation to the potential jobs that you might have. I, mean, so I think something that the mayor mentioned too is really important that um, you know many of the homeless actually have jobs so they may be in the world working for them and you know work at McDonald's and like uh, uh, live in a, in a car part of the month or on somebody's couch they're not people that you would readily identify as being homeless so I think that the location in downtown areas are critical now as you begin to kind of focus on where downtown um, I think that, that was a challenge in Austin to find that site, that specific location. I mean, once it was sort of decided it was going to be within the downtown itself, many sites came up uh, and were suggested. This facility is located right next door to the Salvation Army, a very good facility in Austin. So there was a sense of kind of a sympathetic uh, possible shared use between the two facilities. In fact, the Salvation Army, Army uh, owned that property and then sold it to the city to develop the site. So that was part of the kind of considerations. I was going to ask you a question about the $50 million. How, how was that related? Five million. Five million? Yes. Five million. Yes. Five million. Yes. Five million. Yes. Five million. Yes. Five So where, where, where was the source of that? It was uh, a loan to the city of Austin by the federal government. It was a HUD loan, which they have to pay back around. I can't remember the terms. A couple other questions on your sleeping area. 100 people. There, there didn't seem, there seem to be a common sleeping area, so how do you deal with the children in that? In that? Um, interesting question. Uh, it was originally conceived as one large kind of open room, but it was eventually, through the design process, divided up in five separate rooms with two of them on the price point. But uh, women and children, originally the, the overnight shelter was meant for men only. That was the way it was broken. Women and children have their own shelter. Now they do allow them to sleep in the facility. I mean, it's managed in such a way that there aren't the issues with the other young men. So, what if you have the home pump? I'm sure there are more than 100 homes in Austin. So, where, where do they get the uh, I mean, That's it, maybe 100 uh, adequate to serve. Mm -hmm. And they can uh, log it with the members of society. Right. 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 What, I think we're from that. Yeah, I think that um, Michael touched on an important issue, and that's that the shelters and the resource center. You know, aren't going to solve all the problems. The problems really find common housing solutions for the homeless, and that the shelter can kind of help them move forward with that. So the interesting thing is, you know, the size is really important. I mean, again, it's somewhat of a political issue. Two beds, 250, 200 beds. I mean, this is something that we spent a lot of time kind of parsing through, both in terms of budget on a practical level, but in terms of like what the community would accept. Front Steps, which is a very progressive organization, has tackled this problem. By we as architects have worked on this as well by creating a single document. So we've taken this, actually the subject probably for another lecture, but this is uh, an organization, uh, Front Steps, and an organization in Austin called Foundation Communities, which have taken um, extended stay hotels and, in the case of the product we worked on, abandoned nursing homes. The nursing industry is kind of around its head. We've turned them into single occupancy apartments. And these are, again, are managed apartments that are very clean. Sustainable, uh, the homeless can, can in rent space, we have 200 square feet. There, you know, it's a sliding uh, sort of rental scale. There are programs for the homeless to um, enter through kind of savings programs to save towards uh, permanent housing. So, in my mind, you know, increasing the number of beds may not be the solution. I mean, the building is too small, it's too small when we open the door. When you open it, boom, it's full right away. I mean, the services were just built right up. And the question is the way, and again, the way um, Austin's approaching it, the not-for-profits there, they're, they're trying to develop uh, longer-term, more sustainable, current housing solutions, like the single occupancy solution. And I think that is really the tremendous potential there. Um, when you were addressing the London shelter, what did the open air green space that you provide anything else out there? And you characterize some of the people that you saw utilizing that as neighboring. Not having breathalyzers and so forth, but you know, as administrator of an ABA facility, I 
way the building operates, again, I'm not a uh, person to really answer these questions correctly, but I know that you can use the shelter and you don't have to become part of what they call case management. If you're case managed, you get a permit, you get a bed for a certain number of days, I believe it's 90 days. So there are advantages to being what they call case management. And a caseworker is assigned to you, and that caseworker will address all of your different needs, maybe a health needs, maybe um, uh, you know, either insurance or a job or finding permanent housing, or whatever those issues might be, there's something there that can help you with that. But, but let me ask you this, we, we're gonna have, we got a lot of these folks that want to visit. We got, I think we've got time for two more questions. I think the major has one here.